Today's episode is brought to you by Dave, the banking app building a better financial future. There's a lot of anxiety and stress that comes with certain expenses. Traditional cash advances just make those feelings worse. And that's why banking with Dave could get you up to $500 instantly with extra cash. You don't even need to bank with Dave to use extra cash. You can link your normal bank account to your extra cash account. All you have to do is head over to dave.com slash let's read to sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. There are no credit checks or late fees and no interest is charged with extra cash. All you need is a mobile device with access to the internet and a valid email address. Dave is open, honest, and straightforward, and it puts its members' financial interests first. So, if you're in need of some extra cash during one of the most difficult holiday seasons in memory, head over to dave.com slash let's read and sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking provided by Evolve Bank & Trust. Member FDIC. So the events of this story must be without a doubt the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. I don't know how scary the story is, it's just very weird. I didn't know where to share my story so I figured writing it for the internet was my best bet and I hope you enjoy my strange and weird story from March Madness last year. I worked as a security guard for hire in San Francisco, California, one of the locations of the men's NCAA basketball tournament last year. For anybody who doesn't know, Every year, the NCAA holds the March Madness Basketball Tournament. It's a massive 68-team tournament, if you count the play-in games, to determine the national champion of college basketball. Every year, it is one of the most anticipated sports events, even for those who don't like basketball or even sports. As you would expect, something of this magnitude involves a ton of fans, which, as a result, you need a lot of security. For the most part, as a security guard, I have not seen anything too crazy. The typical stuff, sure. I've had to throw people out for drunken incidents, bringing something they shouldn't into the arenas, and one time, I even had to throw someone out who tried to go streaking across the court. But nothing stranger than when I had to work with the March Madness tournament. It was the regional final, which means the winner of that game would go to the final four of the entire tournament. The game started a little before 6pm PDT, but before the game, there was a few thousand strong tailgating fans. Fans of Arkansas and Duke were going wild, hence why they beefed up security. For the most part, the crowds were fine while they were tailgating. A little bit of ruckus here and there, but ultimately it was just people having fun. Who am I to stop them unless they're hurting someone or breaking the rules? A few hours until tip-off, maybe around 3 to 4 p.m., a little man walked up to me. This guy had to be about 5 foot 2, built like a meatball. He had a scruffy beard that was patchy and wild hair that went every direction you can think of. He was wearing a New York Yankees windbreaker and a New York Mets hat. I'm not a big baseball guy, but I think the New Yorkers would probably frown on that. And I asked the man, You alright, sir? And he responded with the weirdest sentence I thought I would ever hear at a March Madness tailgating event. He said in a squeaky voice, uh, Yes, my good man, uh, I'm looking for a place to meditate. Uh, for you see, I, I need to meditate so I can alert them that I'm here. Yeah, I had no clue how to respond to that request, and I was not even going to attempt to unpack that. I just respond in a friendly tone, uh, Sorry, but I don't think you're going to find a spot like that here. The man grabbed my hand as I started to walk away and said, Well, that's too bad, isn't it? I'll have to find another way to alert them. Well, good day, sir. The man turned around and walked away. Now this man was not a threat physically, but I definitely made a note of this interaction and radioed it into some of the other guards just in case. He wasn't doing anything wrong at all, but he was talking about alerting people and whatnot. I had to keep thousands of people safe, I just wanted to make a mental note about him. I figured he was drunk or something, nothing to be too concerned about. A few hours passed and the fans started to enter the arena and the game commenced. Duke defeated Arkansas, and the fans started to leave after the game. 
We helped to assist thousands of fans of their cars, and we had several guards outside to make sure everything was safe in the parking lot. As the last of the fans were trickling out of the arena, I saw my little friend again with his bright Yankee coat. He was sitting inside of a supply closet on the ground in the concessions area. I didn't even want to know how he got in there. I just wanted him gone. Okay, bud. Time to go. Get up. Get out. So we want to involve anybody else here. He didn't respond or acknowledge me whatsoever. He was mumbling under his breath, but nothing I could make out. It just sounded like random mumbling. Hey, do you hear me? I started to shout. The one thing about this line of work is that sometimes you gotta be a jerk. I don't enjoy it, but it's part of the job. I said to the man one last time, Sir, this is your last warning. The man finally turned to me and said, Ah, good. You're here just in time. I just alerted them. Not taking any chances, I called for backup. Just in case there was more to the situation, I wanted to make sure that I covered all my loose ends. In a minute or two, several of my fellow security guards were standing with me. I warned the man and said, All right, bud. We're escorting you out of here. I don't care where you go, but you gotta leave the arena unless you want us to call the police, actually. The man started to laugh uncontrollably. We all looked at each other in this sort of bewilderment. This was so weird. Clearly, this man was not well. And before one of the other men went to grab the little guy, I told him to hold on. We needed to call the police and get this man some help. Well, the other guard, who happened to be my supervisor, said a certain curse word to me and told me to forget that idea. He grabbed the man, and as soon as he touched him, the man went crazy. He started yelling and laughing all at once, shouting, Yeah! Yeah, they're coming! You're first! <laughs> my supervisor threw him over his shoulder and started to carry him to the entrance of the arena. Against his wishes, I called the police anyway and told them the situation. As a result of the tournament, they already had active duty cops outside the venue. I went outside with the other guards as they tried to basically just toss this man into the wind. Well, while this was happening, the man is still laughing uncontrollably. The cops came over and tried to talk to the man who started to get kind of violent. With us, he was being weird, but with the cops, his tone changed real quick. The squeaky voice turned deep and almost sinister and the man said, Touch me again and you'll regret it. They're coming and they don't like your kind. I started to feel bad for this guy. I just wanted him to get some help at this point. As one of the police officers pulled out his handcuffs, the man jumped back and got on his knees and threw his hands up to the sky and yelled, They're here! Oh, thank you! They're finally here! and then he started to laugh again. Clearly, there was nothing in the sky, but this man saw something in his mind. After his outburst, he fell back and was lying down on the ground completely motionless. The cop yelled at him, but the man didn't move, and we were all a bit floored by all of this. As the cop approached the man to make sure that he was alive, he popped up, put out his hands to be cuffed, and didn't say a word. He went with the police and... That was the last I saw of this little weirdo. I don't even think the cops arrested him that night, which kind of makes me upset. That man clearly needed help, as he seemed to be suffering from something. At no point during this event was I scared, but looking back at the situation, it was just so weird. I still have no idea what was wrong with the man, what he was talking about, what he thinks he saw, or where the man is today. He could still be wandering the streets of San Francisco, or maybe he's in New York with his Yankee and Mets gear. Either way, the brain is a fragile thing. Some people who are harmless could be potentially dangerous. Just be careful out there and watch out for little men who meditate in supply closets. One of the best parts about going to a football game is tailgating prior to the game. I've never been a massive fan of football, but I have always loved the team atmosphere of going to the games. There is something electric about getting together with thousands of people to cheer for a shared goal. For nearly 10 years straight, my brother and I would try to go to as many home Buffalo Bills games as possible, being that it was only a few hours from where we lived. If you know anything about Bills fans, they can be a bit on the wild side to say the least. 
I've witnessed anything you can think of, everything from a legitimate wrestling match in the parking lot, cars on fire, and a countless number of unspeakable acts. You kind of just shrug it off because that's the Bills' experience and it has its charms. My brother and I have since stopped going to the games though and it's not because of the wild fans. Truth be told, I like wild fans. They can be entertaining and fun and they really do create an insane atmosphere for the games. We stopped going for a much darker and nefarious reason. A few years ago, we showed up early like always and started to tailgate with the faithful fan base. It was the same as always, if not even a little mellow for Buffalo fans. We drank some beers, ate some food, listened to music, and got pumped for the game that was about to transpire. All was well in Buffalo that early morning. Around 11 a.m. if I had to guess, my brother nudged me and pointed out a group of guys who were standing by a van. On its own, this isn't alarming at all, but something was off about these guys. Most people here were wearing buffalo colors except for the few who were wearing dolphins colors and these guys were dressed in all black and had full ski masks on. They were talking amongst themselves and not really partaking in the tailgating. We tried to continue to party with everyone else but now I couldn't get my eyes off these guys. They looked like they were staring at us but I didn't want to judge or assume. As the door time approached, the fans in the lot started to dwindle. Before we started to walk toward the gate, for some reason I decided that I wanted to talk to these guys. Maybe I had a bit too much to drink, or maybe the Buffalo Faithful got me going. Either way, this would prove to be a horrible mistake on my part. I got close to the guys, and the overwhelming smell of Axe body spray almost made me pass out. What's up, guys? You ready for the game? No response from these three men outside the van. I made a gesture pointing to the stadium insinuating that they should walk with us. The awkward silence lasted a few seconds, and then I said, Okay then, well, clearly you guys suck. Again, maybe I drank too much. Either way, I shouldn't have said that. I turned my head to see where my brother was, and in the quickest of flashes, I saw my brother walking with the group we were tailgating with, and then everything went black as I felt an intense pain in the back of my head. I blacked out only for a second, and when I came to, these three men were throwing me in the van, and in my foggy state I noticed a driver already sitting in the driver's seat. I tried to muster up some words, but I was dazed and my head hurt so bad. I remember looking down on the floor of the van as they started to drive away with me inside, and I saw this thick metal pipe. I couldn't stop wondering to myself if that was the object that they hit me with. I finally was able to get some words out, and I said, What's going on? Where are we going? The two men in the back of the van with me said nothing, and the man in the passenger seat turned to me and said, Shut up. Don't say a word. Do what we say, and you'll be fine. I wasn't sure how I was even able to comprehend anything that was being said at that point. I could feel something started to pool around my head, and I don't think it was sweat. The driver was erratic with his movements, and I started to feel dizzy. All oh, while this was happening, the two men in the back of the van with me were holding me down so I couldn't move. The entire drive, all four men were talking in some kind of code. It was, it was like English, but it was nonsense, saying things like, the unicorn must eat the book, and just really weird sentences like that. I was feeling a little bit out of it, but I clearly remembered the insanity of what these men were saying, but I also wasn't sure if it was because I was just smacked in the back of the head to the point of bleeding. A few minutes from the stadium, the van stopped, and the men threw me out of the van. They dragged me into some alley and just started beating me up. They kicked me in my ribs and took my cash. They left my wallet and ID and even left my credit cards, which was strange, I thought. They only took my cash. After the beating, the man who was in the passenger seat sat me up against the wall and lifted his mask off. I could clearly make out his face. He was not a bad-looking guy. He seemed to have these really apparent bright blue eyes, blonde hair, incredibly straight teeth, and didn't look like the maniac who had been terrorizing me the last few minutes. Then suddenly, the demeanor of the situation changed. He put his hand on my shoulder and looked me right in the eyes and said, Hey bud, I'm real sorry about that. Just let me know where the bag is and this was all over, okay? I was in disbelief. I had just had the worst beating of my life and it was because these guys 
maybe thought that I was somebody else. I responded, What bag? I, I'm not from here. I'm just here for the game. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. The man studied my face for a moment, and then he must have deemed that I was telling the truth. He turned to one of the other guys. Is this not the guy? And the other man just shrugged and said, It looks like him. The blonde man put his head down and shook it in disbelief. He then looked at me again and said, Sorry, man. You just probably had the worst day of your life, and you're not even who we're looking for. He pulled the mask back down and then gave me my money back. As I leaned against the wall of the alley in broad daylight, the men got back into the van and sped off. I was hurting bad, and at that moment, I didn't think to look at the license plate. I wasn't even sure if it was a New York license plate. I felt this feeling in the pit of my stomach, and I just threw up. When I finally was able to gain my composure, I realized that I still had my phone on me, and I called my brother, who never went into the game because he was frantically trying to find me. He showed up to the alley with the police in what felt like two minutes or so, and by this point I was banged up and I don't really remember a lot of the details of getting from there to eventually the hospital. I ended up with a concussion and some bruises. No broken ribs or stitches or anything of that sort. Thankfully not in my head either, the doctor said I didn't need them, and it was tricky making a police report because I didn't see the van other than in the lot or any of the men other than the blonde guy. They didn't rob me and they let me go. And though the beating would be enough to get these guys in trouble, I gave the best report that I could and that was that. I never heard back from the police and I guess I just kind of went on with my life. And that was several years ago and I have yet to go to any sports games. I don't even watch football on TV anymore. I haven't been to Buffalo and I don't want to go anytime soon. This is not a negative review of Buffalo or the Bills. I really like Buffalo. I just sustained so much trauma there that I never want to go back. Does anybody out there have any idea what this could have been? My theory was that these guys were just some sort of petty criminals and I got caught at the wrong place at the wrong time. So let me first say before I tell my story that I'm going to keep my name and the location of the story completely anonymous for certain legal reasons, obviously. Several years ago, I used to be a thief. It's not something I'm proud of, and if I could give advice to any young people out there, it would be to find other ways to succeed in life. No matter how horrible you think life may be, there's always another way. I got into this dark career path at a young age, and it became my way of life for over a decade. With that being said... Here's my story of the most terrifying thing that ever happened to me while being a criminal. I started stealing in high school for no real reason other than I could. It was not about the thrill or about surviving. At that point in my life, I just wanted to see if I could do it without getting caught. I would steal a candy bar at the gas station, a soda at the store, and even random things like chapstick from a purse. I realized quickly that I was good at stealing things. I know that sounds horrible and I'm not proud of that fact, but being a social outcast in high school, it was just nice to find something I was good at. The older I got, the more I stole. I got better at stealing from stores. Instead of stealing soda, I started to steal steaks, and then steaks turned into entire shopping carts full of groceries. Believe it or not, I actually pulled that off, and for me, it was about discipline. I would always do my research. I would know who was working at what time, how many doors were in the building, and even the layouts of the stores so I could pin my route from start to finish. My horrible talent became a full-on operation. After graduating from high school and committing pointless theft for a couple of years, I decided to make the decision to be a thief as my full-time job. At that point in my life, I didn't think I had any real-world skills other than stealing. In the years that followed, I literally stole anything I could get my hands on but I made my ultimate living robbing cars. And I don't mean physically stealing cars, but robbing the insides of the vehicles. Specifically, I would rob the insides of cars during sporting events. While hundreds, if not thousands of people tailgated, I would blend in with the crowd, and oftentimes even party with the fans of the game. 
The stadium near my house at the time had a parking lot located close to the venue and you didn't need to pay to park there. The fans would park their cars, set up tents and grills and party for hours before the game. I would spend hours meeting people while tailgating, learning about the personalities of the people and most importantly finding out what kind of cars they drive. When the fans would make their way to the stadium, I would secretly start to slip their keys into my bag. I know it sounds crazy, but you would be surprised how many people don't check their vehicles before heading to the game. Some would even realize that they lost their keys and basically they don't care because they want to make it to the game on time or just party with their friends. Once the crowd thins out and the lot is virtually abandoned, I would start my theft. Car after car I would rob and fill my bag. So many people leave their wallets, cash, or credit cards in the car during the game. More often times than not, women would leave their purses in the car and I would clean out the cash. After my theft, I would leave the key on the seat of the car, staging a scene that makes it look as if the key fell out of the driver's pocket. I apologize for the long setup, but understanding how I operated during these tailgating events is important to understand what happened the night I got caught. The night I will never forget. So my night started like most other afternoon operations. This specific game was a night game which I loved because I could use nightfall as protection to move in the dark. During the late afternoon tailgating sessions I did my thing and met a bunch of people. Everything was going according to plan and I secured several keys in my bag. Once the tailgating lot cleared out I started my job. I approached my first car and got lucky right off the bat. The passenger seat contained a purse with $1,200 in cash. If the remainder of my keys contained nothing, the night would still be a success in my mind. Once I cleaned out the purse and closed the door, I noticed two figures standing in the lot. I had my own personal rules to protect myself when this happened, so I didn't look sketchy. I turned to the figures and shouted, My wife forgot her purse. Of course she sent me. I opened the car door again and grabbed the entire purse and... I laughed and started to walk toward the stadium. Remember, I still have my bag full of car keys and now I also have this stranger's purse as well. As I left the lot, I turned and noticed the two figures following me. I started to walk a little faster and when I turned, the figures were now moving at the same pace as me. When I was a good distance away from the lot, I started to sprint. To my horror, the two figures were now sprinting after me. My first thought was, I was screwed. I figured I was caught, but I couldn't figure out how I was caught. Running down the main road that led to the stadium, I decided to make a hard right turn and I started to cut down the side streets to where I hid my car. The figures were still following me. I got to my car quickly and locked the door immediately as I tried to start my car. The figures ran past my car and got into the car that was parked behind me. At this point, I couldn't figure out what was happening. Who were these people, and how did they know who I was and what I drove? I hit the gas and drove as fast as I could, but they were right on my tail. About five miles from the stadium, I was still being chased. I thought maybe turning down a narrow one-way street would be an ideal route to lose this car, as I've seen this tactic in movies and all that kind of stuff, but as I turned down the one way, I was cut off by another car in front of me. I was now sandwiched between two vehicles. I know at this point if you're reading this you're probably thinking I deserve what's coming to me, and you're right, but this was still the scariest moment of my life. I didn't know if I was caught by the cops and I was going to get arrested, or if this was someone who was onto my game or just a random targeting. In that moment of sitting in my car I contemplated my options. Ultimately I decided to get out and run. I grabbed my bag which contained the purse I stole and the keys and I ran. As I approached the car at full speed on foot, several people got out and grabbed me right away. I'm not sure if it was a man or a woman. The figure was small and they were wearing a mask. I specifically remember it being this cheap plastic tiger mask that you could buy at any Halloween store. I tried to slither my way out of their hands, and I did and ran to the end of the narrow street. Once I got to the main road, I ran about a mile away to the 24-hour gas station, figuring the public location would be safe. After a couple of minutes, I saw the two vehicles come into the lot of the gas station. I started to panic and told the person behind the counter. This is the point in my life when karma finally caught up to me. By chance, there were two cops in the gas station. 
During football games, they always patrol the surrounding areas for drunk drivers and rowdy fans. The cops approached me and asked why I was being so frantic. I exclaimed that cars had been following me and that they tried to jump me. I guess I must have been freaking out because the cops just telling me to relax and were asking me for ID. Realizing that the purse and keys were still in the bag, I immediately dialed myself back, which was even more suspicious. I got quiet because I tried to calculate my options, but there was so much running through my mind I didn't know what to say or what to do. The cop spoke up again in a firm voice, Can I please see your ID, son? I was a bit apprehensive, but I went into my bag and grabbed my ID. Maybe it was my nerves or maybe it was just my luck finally running out but I dropped my backpack and scattered on the floor was the purse and about eight sets of car keys. The cops looked at the keys and this is when the real question started. I started to panic and itch. The cops knew I was lying. I looked outside and saw what I thought were my chasers standing outside of their vehicles and their masks were off. I didn't recognize any of these people. A few men and women all stood outside smiling at me through the windows. Needless to say, after putting my foot in my mouth a few times, the cops were able to put two and two together, and I was eventually caught. The cops found the owners of the keys, and half of the tailgaters were able to positively ID me. I served several years in jail, and had ample time to think about that evening. Honestly, being a thief may have saved my life. After a long time thinking about this event, I think it was just a random targeting. If the cops didn't arrest me, those masked figures may have eventually got to me, and who knows what their intentions may have been. Life is kind of funny sometimes. That may have been the most terrifying night of my life, from the abductors to getting arrested, but without that night, I would have never reformed and changed my life around. Remember what I said earlier, there was always another way in life. I'm lucky to be alive and reformed, and I have tiger-masked intruders to thank for that. I would have to say the only thing I love more than going to football games is tailgating before the game. I love the atmosphere, the people, and the overall fun. What could be more fun for a sports fan than sitting around eating good food, drinking cold beer, and throwing the football around? I've been tailgating with my family since I was 10 years old. Now I'm 30, just for a bit of context. For the most part, my family has gone with the same people every year. We have season tickets through my dad's work, so it's always been the same group of people. The older I got, though, the less I wanted to party with the older adults and the more I wanted to hang out with people my own age. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but in my early 20s is when I met Brittany while tailgating. On this specific game... I went walking around looking for some of my friends. I found some friends from school and hung out with them for a while. While I was drinking some beer, I noticed this beautiful girl looking at me, smiling. I played stupid for a little while because I'm absolutely horrible at picking up signals like this from girls. After a few minutes, she came over and said something to me. I blushed, but definitely was smooth about it. Well, I think I was smooth, I probably looked like an idiot. After a little giggling, she said in a shy voice, I'm Brittany. What's your name? I told her my name, and we shook hands like we were in a business meeting. My friends were laughing at me, and I could hear them making comments under their breath. I'm not the best when it comes to interactions with someone I'm attracted to, also. And after some minor small talk, I finally dropped the big question and said in a nervous voice, Would it be okay if I got your number? She smiled and nodded. She grabbed my phone and put her number in there as Brittany with a heart emoji. She then leaned in for a big hug and dropped my phone in my back pocket. While hugging me, she leaned in and whispered, Don't forget to text me. She stepped away, smiling, and waved as she disappeared back into the crowd. I couldn't believe what just happened. My friends came over and high-fived me and did all the masculine stuff that boys do when they talk to a pretty girl. I shouted for a beer and we all had a beer in celebration of my successful interaction. And after a while, we continued to party for a bit and then went our separate ways. We met back up with my family and we went to the game. After the awesome overtime win, all I could think about was texting Brittany. 
In fact, the entire game, all I could think about was texting her. I didn't want to appear too eager, so I waited until I got home that night to text her, and my first message was at 8.46pm. She messaged me nearly right away, and here is our entire conversation. Hey Brittany, it's Nate. So happy I got to meet you today, what's up? Hey Nate, I have to admit I am a little disappointed. Why? You never texted me earlier. I thought you liked me. <laughs> Lol, I do like you, I didn't want to seem too eager. I texted you as soon as I got home. I thought you were different, Nathan. Uh, Nathan? Lol, am I in trouble? I'm going to end you. Excuse me? What does that mean? Your back door is unlocked. What the hell? Your back door is red. There's a fall wreath hanging on the door. The kitchen light is on and your mother was just washing dishes in the sink. I saw it through the window. You better lock your door, Nathan. Dude, that's creepy. Listen, sorry if I offended you or something, but I, I think you should delete my number. I thought this was real. Oh, and your dad just left the living room and is heading upstairs. Are you in my house? Maybe. I could be in your closet. Ugh, I just looked, you're not. This is some messed up joke. It's not a joke. Your parents are in bed now. Come outside if you actually like me. Ew, stop texting me. Okay, I'm coming in then. I did warn you. Are you serious? Brittany? Hello? After a few minutes of no response, I ran downstairs. The back door knob was shaking like someone was trying to open the door from the outside. I tried calling Brittany's phone, but it just kept going to voicemail. I went to the window and peered through the glass. This person trying to break into my house was not Brittany. It was some skinny looking guy with a tattoo on his neck that said ANGEL in huge capital letters. And I ran into the closet in the living room and immediately called the police. The soon-to-be intruder must have been a terrible thief because within the five minutes it took for the cops to show up, this man was still trying to break down the door. When the cops showed up, the man was banging on the door trying to get in. As soon as he saw the lights from the cops' cars, he ran and, unfortunately, the cops were never able to catch him through the backyards. When I heard the cops, I got out of hiding and let them in and noticed that I had one more message from that guy that said, Smart man, that would have been your end. After giving the police all the information and quote unquote Brittany's number, it turned out that the phone had been stolen. The phone belonged to an older woman who lost her phone at the football game. Unfortunately, there was no other news on this story. They never caught Brittany and her accomplice and never found out how they knew where I lived. And the cops think that they must have been following me from the football game. I stayed in that house for a few more years until I bought my own house and I was terrified almost every night that they would come back. I don't know what I could have done differently to avoid this from happening. In hindsight, I should have contacted a friend or the police when this Brittany person started acting weird, but I didn't want to overreact in the moment, not knowing if it was some type of sick joke, I guess. Just please be careful, my friends. There are some truly horrible people out there. My favorite thing in the world is going to concerts and listening to live music. I started going to concerts with my dad at a young age and by the time I was in college I was going with my friends all over the United States. I have seen shows in football stadiums, dive bars and even the middle of the desert. There really isn't anything out there quite like live music. Several years ago, the boy I was seeing at the time named Chuck scored us four tickets to this massive music festival. I was beyond excited about this. We were going to stay right at the festival grounds and camp out. Now ordinarily, I wouldn't travel this far with a new boyfriend, if you could even call him that, but the fact that he got four passes and told me to ask a friend, I thought it was a great idea. And you will soon find out this was in fact a horrible idea that almost cost me everything. When we arrived at this festival, it was everything I could have ever wanted at a concert and more. Anybody who had ever been tailgating, it was a lot like that, plus the added excitement of camping. 
I gave the two extra tickets to my friend Jade and her fiancé Ben. They were new to the concerts, camping, tailgating, basically anything fun type arena, you know. And Jade and Ben recently graduated from college and were ready to do some fun and different things before starting their life and careers together. And the weekend started off amazingly. We jammed out to a bunch of different acts and then went back to our tents and partied some more. Chuck wanted to set up the tents on the outskirts of the campgrounds, which I wasn't a huge fan of at the time. Not because I thought it was weird or a red flag or anything like that, but because I wanted to be near as many people as possible in this environment. Chuck compromised with me though, which I thought was nice at the time. We set up our tents on the outskirts like he wanted, but we ventured into the heart of the campgrounds to party with everyone there. When I say it's a lot like tailgating, I'm not kidding. Within seconds of being in this area, we were drinking, eating, jamming out to some awesome music. Ben even went and played a game of football with a bunch of guys, but Chuck just kind of stood there and watched. Some people aren't sports guys, so it is what it is, I thought, but what did give me some pause was the fact that Chuck didn't even seem like a concert guy. He seemed off and quiet, which was not like him at all. While I was partying with Jade and some new people that we met, I would periodically look over at Chuck who would either be walking around or talking to random people like he knew them. It was a little sketchy, but I was there for some fun and I was intent on having a good time. I had pretty much mentally decided that I was going to break things off with Chuck after the weekend, but for now, I was going to party like it was my last night alive. Little did I know, it was indeed almost my last night alive. We went back and listened to some music and then went back to the tailgating area to party before we called it an evening. Chuck was talking to this weird guy who introduced himself to me as Colin. Chuck said that he knew Colin from high school and that he was a great guy. Colin was just like Chuck in a sense, he didn't look like he was enjoying himself at all and was also as quiet as a church mouse. After a few hours we decided to head back to our tents to the outskirts and before we walked away completely, Colin said, hey guys. Be careful on your way over there. I know that bears can often be found in the forest next to your tents. We all walked away saying to ourselves, like, what's wrong with this guy? I walked ahead and poked my head in between Jade and Ben and said, sorry guys, I, I didn't realize how weird Chuck and his friend are, but thanks for coming with me. I put my arms around them and continued walking with them and I could feel Chuck walking nearly right on top of me. We arrived at the tents and got all cozy inside. All four of us were staying in the one tent. I pulled out the Uno deck and we played a few games which was a nice wind down from the events of the afternoon and night. Every ten minutes or so, Chuck had to keep leaving the tent to pee or smoke a cigarette. I knew he smoked but I didn't realize he smoked so much. It was weird and I didn't, really didn't trust what he was doing. And my alarm bells were screaming at me but I didn't think I could do anything. I thought maybe he was just feeling the same way that I felt about the relationship and just kind of wanted some space. After a few games, we turned out the flashlight and tried to get some rest. It was shortly after 3am if I had to guess. Not too long after that, Chuck nudged me, awakening me from my light sleep and said, I think there's a bear outside the tent. I listened but was saying to myself that this guy's an idiot. And Before I said anything out loud, I heard something, There! He said in a frantic voice, Did you hear that? I nodded and tried to wake up Jade and Ben, who were now starting to roll around groggily. Chuck grabbed the flashlight and pointed it at the wall of the tent, and to our absolute horror, there was a silhouette outside the tent. But if it was a bear, it was the weirdest bear I'd ever seen. The creature was on all fours and grunting, but it was so small and skinny, it just was not the size of a bear. Oh my god! Jake said as she clinched onto Ben's arm. Chuck then whipped the flashlight to the other side and another silhouette appeared. Chuck said in a passive voice, Multiple bears outside the tent, guys. I think we should try and run. I'll go first and help you out. That seemed like a terrible idea, but I had no clue what to do when bears attacked. When Chuck grabbed the zipper, Ben grabbed his arm and said, Whoa, dude, what are you doing? This is absolutely the worst thing to do right now. Turn the light off and just sit still. That also sounded terrible, but I trusted Ben more than Chuck. He made a face of disgust toward Ben and said, Listen, college boy, you may have a degree, but out here I know what's best for the group. 
Ben just looked at Chuck like he was going to hit him, but I was floored because I've never heard Chuck even remotely say or do anything like that ever. I'm going out there, I'll lead us to safety, Chuck said with arrogance in his voice. He unzipped the tent and whispered back, Okay, the coast is clear, hurry up, grab my hand, babe. He reached his hand into the tent to grab my hand. As I slowly reached out, Ben held me back and Ben grabbed his hand instead. Immediately upon making contact, Chuck grabbed the hand and pulled him out. Not pulled, more like dragged him out. Ben screamed and said in a voice that still haunts me, Guys, run now! We got up and busted through the tent door. Ben had Chuck pinned down and was fighting two other guys who were wearing all black and, I kid you not, wearing bear masks. I was so confused in that moment and Jade was crying and screaming for Ben but I told her to keep running. I figured if we could just make it to some other tents we would be safe. I was just nervous as to how much time Ben had left. We turned around several times and saw one of the bear masks actually chasing us. On two feet now, and the bear charade was over. As the man grabbed the back of my hooded sweatshirt, Ben came in like some football player and tackled this guy hard into the ground. He got up and ran with us until we made it to the campgrounds and thankfully, there were still dozens of people there drinking and having fun. We screamed for help and without hesitation, tons of people got up and were ready to do battle. I had never experienced a community like that in my entire life. Ben, along with ten other guys, ran back into the forested area looking for these guys. They came back a short time later and only found the bear masks that were left behind. They didn't find anything else other than our tent had been robbed, which wasn't much, thankfully, a little bit of cash that we had left and that was everything. All of Chuck's stuff was gone as well, which was no surprise. The masks were horrifying. They weren't your cheap drugstore plastic masks, but real heavy masks with actual fur on them. They looked almost movie quality. We involved security and then the authorities and this just proved to be a waste of time. With thousands of people at this venue, they couldn't find the three guys. When I tried to get results with Chuck, everything from the last few weeks appeared to be a lie. Chuck was not his real name. The phone we texted on was not a real phone and was already off. And the place he told me he worked at was a complete lie as that place had never heard of Chuck or didn't even recognize his picture. Whoever Chuck and his friends were, they were completely off the grid. He had picked me up from my apartment a few times but luckily he never went inside so he didn't know which actual apartment was actually mine. I spent more than a few nights and weekends staying overnight with Jade and Ben just until I felt somewhat safe, even though I never felt safe in that apartment complex and I eventually moved out about six months after this incident. I still thank Ben every day of my life for saving us in that horrible situation. I don't know what would have happened if Ben wasn't there. I'll never forget the fear that I felt in those brief moments and that is why I never go anywhere with a new significant other until I know that I can completely trust them. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. For years, my best friend Nick and I have been mega fans of professional wrestling. And I know for some people it's a bunch of big sweaty men slapping each other in their underwear, but for us, it was so much more. We love the athleticism, the stories, and the pageantry. And if you don't know anything else about wrestling, I can't stress enough about how much pageantry there is. Wrestling is often larger than life, with essentially superheroes coming to life on stage in front of thousands. Sometimes some wrestling shows sell out entire football stadiums. However, the story is not a love letter to professional wrestling, but instead something much more sinister. This is a story about how my love for professional wrestling and my naive nature almost got me seriously hurt, or worse. Back in April of 2014, the largest wrestling company in the world, the WWE, was coming to my home state for the biggest wrestling show of the year, WrestleMania. The show would be at the Superdome, which is where the New Orleans Saints play football. WrestleMania weekend is an entire weekend affair. There are events to meet the wrestlers, a Hall of Fame induction ceremony, tailgating, and, of course, the main show which is on Sunday evening. 
This wrestling show is like the Super Bowl for wrestling fans. The one thing about wrestling that is different compared to most other sports is the camaraderie of the fans. At a sports event, nine times out of ten most of the fans at the arena are for the hometown team, with a few fans of the visiting team. In wrestling, you have your good guys and bad guys and everybody has their favorites, but whether you like a wrestler or hate them, at the end of the day, everybody there is a fan of wrestling. There is more of a community among these fans than any sports teams that I had ever been to, and WrestleMania is like the ultimate fan fest. Until this point, I had always been a huge fan of wrestling, but never have gone to a major show. Nick and I partook in all the events over the weekend, and were excited that Sunday was finally here. We had heard from guests at the hotel that we were staying at that fans were meeting at the stadium parking lot to tailgate before the event. The thought of partying with wrestling fans all day was an awesome thought to my brother and I. The next morning, we drove to the venue early, and to our surprise, there were already hundreds if not thousands of fans already there. We parked the car, and it was just like any other tailgating I've been to. People were eating, listening to music, throwing a football around, and to top it off, it was a beautiful morning. Within just a couple of hours, we had found a group of people that we stuck around, about our age and these people like the same wrestlers as us as well. It was only a matter of time until we all started wrestling with each other. Just messing around but performing basic moves you would see on TV. I should say here that I am a big guy. I'm about 6'5 and I've got some muscles to my frame. I'm embarrassed to admit this now but at the time, being 21 years old, I wanted to be a professional wrestler more than anything in the world. This is where my naiveness almost doomed me. After we were jostling around, an executive looking woman came up to me. I say executive because she looked really corporate a very fancy pants, suit, heels, and whole works. She pulled me aside, which at first made me nervous because I didn't know if I was in trouble or something. Once we had a few feet distance from the group, she gestured for me to bend over a little bit so she could whisper to me, and she said, Hey, I saw your moves back there. You know, you have some talent and size, and I think you could make an excellent addition to our roster. I didn't know how to feel. I was excited beyond comprehension. I didn't think to question this woman at all or ask about her credentials or anything and like I said, I was naive and I loved wrestling and this woman knew that. With a smile that could light up a room, I responded in an excited tone, I I'd love to be a part of your roster, more than anything in the world. She smiled back and said, okay, well come with me. We're having this segment in the middle of the show tonight where a fan's going to interfere and get in the ring. You'll get to perform some spots before you get taken out. I nodded along with approval, not for one second thinking about how implausible this was. Wrestling takes years of training, and at the biggest show of the year they weren't just going to just throw some random guy to get in the ring and do moves. So, how does that sound? She said, and eagerly I just shouted, let's do it. I started to follow her as she began to walk away. I figured we were going to head into the stadium, but she started to walk in the opposite direction. I didn't ask where we were going because I was honestly just so pumped that I was going to live out one of my dreams. When we got to the end of the parking lot, she pointed to a black SUV across the street. You see that SUV over there? Go with him. He's going to take you around to the back entrance to get ready. I again just smiled and nodded and made my way to the SUV. I knocked on the door to tell the driver that I was getting in and he just gestured back to me to get in. I got into the car and immediately started talking to this guy. He didn't say much and just kept nodding along with me. Through my excitement, I didn't realize that we had been driving away from the stadium. In a tentative voice, I asked the driver, Excuse me, where are we going? The driver said nothing. Before I could troubleshoot my way out of the situation, he stopped the SUV outside of a rundown house. Get out of the vehicle now, the man said in an aggressive tone. I got out, figuring to myself if this was something weird, maybe I could just run. The driver told me to walk to the door and let myself in. When I turned to question the driver, he had his hand in his back pocket, almost as if he were concealing something. I don't know why I kept going along with this plan, which I now was figuring out was probably just some sort of setup. I walked inside, 
and there were about 10 or 15 guys if I had to guess. The house itself was old and falling apart. The windows were boarded up, and the roof in the living room had partially collapsed. Inside the house was another bigger guy like me. He looked scared and tense, much like what I imagine I look like at this point. The driver then came inside the house and locked the door behind him. With rage in his eyes, he pulled out a knife and looked at me and the other tense men and said, Okay, you guys are going to fight right now. If you do what I say, you walk away. If you don't, you won't. The other guy and I looked at each other with the same look. We didn't want to fight. I turned back to the driver and tried to reason with him, but before I could get any words out, he shouted over me in a very aggressive tone, Fight now! The crowd of men that were in this room started to cheer and howl. I tried to size up the room, looking for a way out. I thought I could see another door off the kitchen, which was on the other side of the room. As I peered across the way, I felt an intense pain in my gut. The guy hit me finally. I looked at him as I leaned up in pain. The guy was crying, and he hit me again. Adrenaline must have got a hold of me because I pushed the guy off of me and ran for that door, knocking two other men over in the process. The door was somehow unlocked, so I opened it, and I ran as fast as I could. I could hear the men leaving the house and shutting car doors. I was running through backyards because I didn't want to be on the main road. After cutting through several yards, I got back on the main road and ran. I ran all the way back to my hotel. I called Nick, who never made it into the show because he was still looking for me. He met me at the back of my hotel and we called the police right away and gave our statement. The cops found nobody at this house, and the other fighter must not have called because they received no other reports. I waited for days to hear anything and nothing ever happened. After this event, I became a bit of a homebody. I never found out who tricked me that day or what their end game was, and I'm left with nothing but emotional scars and trauma. I often think about what would have happened if I didn't run to that door if I wasn't a big guy. I always wonder what happened to the other fighter. I hope he was able to get free from whatever plans these men had. To end on a slightly positive note, I did contact WWE after this ordeal just to see if I could potentially have a refund and explain why I didn't make it to the show, and to their credit, not only did they give me a refund, but they gave me tickets to two upcoming shows of my choosing and a signed photograph from my favorite wrestler at the time. Not that any of that makes up for the trauma of that night, but at least there was some positive news that came out of being, in my mind, essentially human trafficked at a WWE match. I'm not sure if this story is scary or just strange, but it's still one of the craziest things that's ever happened to me personally. Every time I tell this story, people always tell me to write it and post it, so here's my attempt at that. Also, please be patient with me as I'm not really a writer. This is the first thing I've written since I've been in high school, so buckle up. I'm reminded of this strange scavenger hunt, for lack of a better term, every time we tailgate, for anything at all, sports, concerts, I've even tailgated for my daughter's ballet recital. I'm not sure exactly how long ago this happened, it was either in the late 80s or early 90s, but I remember the incident vividly. We were tailgating for our hometown college football team. About a mile walk from the stadium is a massive lot where all the fans go to party. It is a fun and absolutely insane time. On this one particular day, our team was playing in the mid-afternoon, which gave us hours to drink and eat some pulled pork and brisket sandwiches. During the tailgating, we noticed a purse on the ground right among our immediate group. Our group consisted of probably 25 people, but still nobody knew where the purse came from. The purse was a normal-sized handbag. I don't know how purses are classified, but I would say you could probably fit a to-go container of wings in the bag for a size reference. The purse was cheetah printed, and that's how I was able to first notice it. The cheetah pattern was loud and stuck out like a sore thumb among all the purple shirts. We kept asking, hey, whose purse is this? But nobody answered, and nobody claimed it. We ignored it for a while. I know there are bad people in the world who would relish this opportunity to actually steal a purse, but we're not like that where I'm from. We continued to party, and the purse just sat there. 
It became a joke after a while with guys yelling, Hey, let's raise a beer to the purse. And we'd all share a laugh and have a drink, and the women would say, Whoever's purse that is, it looks expensive. And like I said, I know nothing about purses, but apparently this was a name brand, and this purse wasn't just some generic handbag. A few hours until kickoff, we decided that we should maybe move the purse into one of the cars, keep it safe for whoever may claim it. I must admit, at this point it became kind of like a game to us. We tried to figure out if anybody had been there and left. Did anybody have kids that came and went, but nobody could remember anything. And it gave us some entertaining conversation for sure. Finally, one of the ladies in our group had the genius idea to check the ID and wallet in the purse. I know what everybody must be thinking to this point. Why are we just now thinking about checking the ID? Well, honestly, we didn't care to earlier. Yeah, we had some fun with the purse, but I was taught you never go through a woman's purse, ever. And we kind of just figured whoever owned the purse would be back eventually, so checking the ID or anything like that just didn't really cross our minds at the time. The first thing I noticed about the purse was that it was super heavy. And this was the first time any of us touched the purse. When I unzipped the top of the bag, I froze for a second. It was a bag of frozen meat. My hometown is chilly this time of year, so the meat in the bag was still stiff. We started pulling them out, and we all kind of had a bit of a laugh. My first thought was somebody brought meat for us to cook, but forgot they froze it, so they just left it aside. Then the horror came. As I finished pulling out the frozen chunks of meat, there was a severed hand in the bottom of this bag frozen solid. We all shouted and immediately screamed and I panicked and threw the bag on the ground. My wife screamed. Someone in the group was already yelling for someone to call the police. Cell phones were not a common thing back in the 80s or 90s and if you had one you probably wouldn't be bringing this big clunky thing to a football game. We didn't know if the hand was even real even though it looked very real. When I threw the bag on the ground, I noticed that there was a note on the bottom of the bag, and all it said was, The Leaning Statue. We all knew exactly what that meant. I don't know the exact name of the statue, but it's on the walk from the lot to the stadium. It has this nickname because all the people in the statue look like they're leaning forward. Now, we should have waited for the police, but a few of us wanted to know what was at the statue. I know that it's horrible and probably tampering with evidence or something, but at that moment we didn't care, we just wanted some kind of answer. Most of the group stayed back and waited for the cops, but a few of us ran to the statue. Chances of something being there with all the people walking to the game were slim, but we had to check in our drunken stupor. When we got there, at first glance there was nothing strange about the location. On the back side of the statue was a little bushy area, no more than knee high at best. I walked through a little bit of the brush and I found another cheetah purse, and my heart sank. I did the stupidest thing I could think of, and I picked it up. I wanted to see if it was heavy like the other purse, and it was just as heavy. I started to unzip it, and my buddy slapped my hand and said, What are you doing? You're getting your fingerprints all of that. Put it down and let's wait for the police. And he was right. I started to freak out. It was my prints that were on both bags now, and we sent someone back to the group to tell them what we found and then waited for the police and told the police what we found there. Underneath that bag was another note with an address on it that I didn't recognize, and this is where I decided I should probably call it quits. I wasn't going to go and be seen in another location. The police did confirm that there was another hand in that bag, and a full-on investigation happened right after. I hate to say this, but I don't know what they found at the next location. I don't know how many more cheetah bags there were. We never were told what the meat in the bag was, and we were never even told if the severed hand was even real. The way the police acted, though, it gave us all the evidence we needed to know if this was real. I went down to the station and gave them all the information I had and told them about my stupidity touching the evidence, and it turns out they thankfully never suspected me due to all the other people they interviewed there, but... I lost sleep for a few nights thinking about how I may get framed for this crime. We never did find out anything else about this weird situation. The cops took it very seriously for a few days and then it seemed to blow over, which made us think that the hands were fake and someone was playing some elaborate hoax of some kind. 
But to anybody reading this, I swear to you, that hand looks so real. I mean, I don't want to go into explicit detail, but I promised you, I think it was legit. I remember everything from that afternoon 30 plus years later. I remember the pit in my stomach. I remember the look and smell of the bag. I'll never forget that smell. Now I know the story isn't wildly crazy or anything, but it was intense and honestly just the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. Has anybody ever had anything as insane like this happen in their hometown? Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the, all the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, you gotta pay to flick my dead nose. <laughs>